It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Governor Mike Pence, Donald Trump's choice for vice president and running mate. Well, who is he and what is he leaving behind in Indiana? To discuss the new vice presidential pick, I'm joined by Amber Stearns. She's a journalist and news editor at Nuvo, an alternative weekly newspaper serving central Indiana. Thank you so much for joining us, Amber. Thank you for having me. So, Amber, give us a rundown. Who is he and uh, your current sitting governor and now president, uh, vice presidential candidate uh, for Donald Trump? Well, he is an Indiana native, born and raised here in Indiana, went to college in Indiana, and he best describes himself. He's called himself a Christian first, then a conservative, and then a Republican. And when you look at his congressional record as well as the issues that he's championed as governor here in Indiana, uh, the Christian conservative really comes through. He had started tackling social issues right off the bat, even though his predecessor, uh, former Governor Mitch Daniels, who's now president of Purdue University, shied away from all of the social issues, saying that we had better things to worry about in Indiana. Mike Pence picked up the flag of social issues and has carried it for the last three years at least, and it didn't look like he was going to stop until suddenly he became Donald Trump's vice presidential pick. And uh, who supports him politically thus far as, as the governor, not to mention who's going to be supporting him in the run-up to uh, vice president? He is very strong among the evangelical Christian voting population. That was one of the things that struck me as why he made sense for being Donald Trump's vice presidential pick because he could really secure that part of the base that Trump had been kind of weak in. Um, here in Indiana, in our primary, he actually endorsed Ted Cruz. He didn't say anything negative about Donald Trump at all. He said he had met with all of the presidential nominees and he had spoke very highly of all three at the time because John Kasich technically was still in the race even though he didn't have a snowball's chance. But he never said anything negative about Donald Trump. But the fact that he endorsed Ted Cruz really showed where his thinking and his alignment was. He's very strong among the evangelical Christians here in Indiana. We have a strong population. Um, that's a very raw base. And the Tea Party. He's never officially associated himself with the Tea Party, but he's always spoken um, complimentary of their positions, of the things that they champion. So even though he doesn't call himself a Tea Party Republican, he does lean towards that base. So he pulls in that group as well. Now, before Indiana, he uh, served in Washington, and he was closely affiliated with ALEC, uh, which is a Koch Brothers-funded initiative. Uh, tell us more about his uh, prior record here. His connection to ALEC is very strong. In fact, he had considered, or at least that was the rumor mill, he had considered jumping into the fray for the Republican primary for president. He did have his eyes set on the White House, but he had a few problems here at home. In the process of setting that up, he actually had allowed, shall we say, a few of his personal staffers to become staffers with Koch Industries along with ALEC. Um, Alec is having their annual conference here in Indiana in just a couple of weeks, and he was scheduled to give at least one, if not two, speeches during their conference here. Um, he's been noted to attend various functions for Alec. He's been noted to be good friends with the Koch brothers. So the fact that he also brings in that faction as well, again, made it no surprise that he was the vice presidential pick. Now, early on, there were some rumors that uh, the Koch brothers would rather support Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump. Does this um, change that configuration? I think it gives them something to think about, and I think that the Trump campaign is hopeful that securing Mike Pence as their vice presidential pick will bring in that group back into the fold. Um, Mike Pence has been called a Republican's Republican. Um, he is 100 percent a diehard as far as the party is concerned. So I think there's that hope that he will bring in the Koch brothers, he will bring in others like the Bushes, for instance, that have been anti-Donald Trump for so long because he is really aligned himself with those groups and those people. So it's possible. 
And as you just said, he's a model conservative, um, and he uh, has a record of wanting to slash taxes and has been unilaterally or some uh, other, others have benefited from the kinds of moves that he's made um, while governing. Uh, give us some examples of what that has been like. Um, it's very interesting because he was handed Indiana by the previous governor pretty secure. Mitch Daniels was known as a bean counter. He was a, a numbers guy and budget director for Ronald Reagan. So he really kind of led the state through the recession, cut budgets in every department you could possibly imagine from education to transportation, infrastructure, you name it, their budgets were minimized. Mike Pence continued that to help build his reputation of cutting taxes, cutting um, government spending here locally, again, so he could build that resume of executive power. And it seemed to do well for the first year. And Indiana was able to turn its economy around. We've brought in several, he's brought in several jobs over the last couple of years. But the caveat to that is that they're low paying jobs. Indiana's uh, net value, as it were, has not increased. It's kind of been stagnant since the recession because the jobs that have been brought in haven't been high paying jobs. But, and then on the flip side, um, some of the areas that he cut, it's been criticized that they were cut too much. We've had some infrastructure problems. Um, bridges that had been slated for repair were actually put on the back burner in order to accommodate those cuts. And then we had a bridge collapse and cause a major artery that connects Indianapolis to Chicago had to shut down in order for that bridge to be repaired. So then the legislature, our state legislature, had to quickly fix those, those types of things. So it's been kind of a double-edged sword where he's been able to show that he's you know, been able to stabilize Indiana's economy, but there have been some side effects to that. Right. And uh, finally, Amber, no, uh, Pence is publicly known as an uh, adamant climate change denier. Is this reflected in policy in Indiana, and what can we look forward to in terms of uh, his vice presidency? It is very much reflective in his governorship. Let me tell you that he is a friend of coal. Um, he was one of the governors who signed a uh, a letter requesting President Obama to reconsider the EPA's uh, clean power plan. Um, we've had a lot of activity as far as protests and, and people really pledging, getting, trying to get the legislature's attention for more solar power support, for more cleaner energy, to have some of our coal plants um, shut down. It was just a matter of uh, it was a matter of economics and slightly politics that the last remaining urban coal burning power plant here in Indianapolis, uh, Indianapolis Power and Light suddenly shifted and closed that down and went to natural gas. But he, Governor Pence was one who did not want that to happen. Um, Indiana has not as large of a coal industry as, let's say, Virginia or West Virginia, but substantial to the point where he has been very pro-coal. Um, it's been rumored that climate change is a dirty word in his administration, so you won't necessarily hear it through the state house. Um, that hasn't been proven, but I'm trying to prove it. And one uh, last question to you, um, given the con situation across the country, across the nation, and what's going on in terms of police uh, community relations. Uh, give us a sense of how he has stood on race relations in the state of Indiana. Not very well. That has been one social issue that he has been relatively silent in. Now, he did just days, probably hours, I think maybe 48 to 72 hours prior to his announcement as vice presidential pick. He went on a neighborhood walk through um, our capital city's most uh, uh, challenged urban areas where there's been high crime and different things of that nature. Um, our police department has a fairly good reputation, so we haven't had any instances of that nature in a while. But he did go on a walk with a neighborhood group that has been vigilant and trying to keep crime down. He has never done that in the history of his congressional career. He's never done that in the history of him being governor in the three years. But suddenly that happened right before the announcement. Again, something that's suspect because it wasn't anything that he had in his wheelhouse. 
Amber, I thank you so much for joining us. And I know this is going to be a very important issue in the next couple of days as the uh, Republican convention is uh, rolling out all of their, um, I guess, the, the dog and pony show at the uh, RNC. And we'll be back to discuss uh, Governor Pence with you once again. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.